Hey, um, I was about to say good morning, but hi. <laughs> um, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce Hussein Haqqani, our speaker for today. Ambassador Haqqani was Pakistan's ambassador to the United States from 2008 to 2011. He is currently a professor of international relations at Boston University and also works as director for South and Central Asia at the Hudson Institute. <coughs> In his past, he has been a journalist, an academic, an ambassador. He was advisor to four of Pakistan's prime ministers, including Benazir Bhutto. And my favorite is he is the author of one of my favorite books that I assigned in my US and Pakistan course, Between, um, between Mosque and Military, which is probably one of the best available things that looks at Pakistan's internal decision making and how it expresses itself in the world, until I'm told there's a new book that will be coming out later on this year. Um, Magnificent Delusions, U.S.-Pakistan Relations, in March, April? October. First of October. <laughs> you know, the semester starts in August. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very and much, Sharon. Thank coming. you also for the commercial. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll elaborate and run the commercial break a little longer because that will provide me with a segue into what I have to say today. Uh, my first book, of course, was Pakistan Between Mosque and Military, and I don't know how many of you have either read, a, read it, read of it, or heard of it. Basically, in that book, what I did was, this was in the context of the post-9-11 environment, Pakistan was being discussed, and I can see a few faces which look at least sort of, you know, Pakistani. Pakistanis always feel very resentful that the world doesn't understand us, you know, and we are, we are looked down upon, etc. So I thought, you know, I need to sort of try and find out because the way history and Pakistan's own history is taught in Pakistan is a very particular narrative. And that particular narrative basically is very simplistic. It is, you know, uh, Muhammad bin Qasim, the uh, Arab prince, came to India uh, way back uh, in 700 and... Uh, 712 AD, and when he came in 712 AD, he brought Islam to South Asia, and Hindus and Muslims never uh, basically uh, coexisted uh, except when the Muslims were in power, and as a result, when the British came, uh, everything was turned upside down, and so when the time for independence of India came, the Muslims needed to break away and create a separate country called Pakistan and since Pakistan came into being India has been an existential enemy to Pakistan we have a battle over Kashmir which is a question of life and death for Pakistan um, that's why Pakistan pursues nuclear weapons uh, the Americans we, we, we did so much for the Americans we became their allies we helped them break the Soviet Union and look at these perfidious Americans, imperialists that they are, they've never actually ever kept their promises with us, etc., etc., etc. So that's the Pakistani narrative. That's what kids learn from grade three onwards all the way to their master's degrees. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of confusion in between uh, about, about facts and, 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 and detail. And so when I was forced into exile, uh, by General Musharraf in 2002, the only thing I'm actually grateful to General Musharraf for. I came to the United States and I was at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and I decided to really delve into uh, this narrative and come up with Pakistan between Moscow. And I reached the conclusion that basically Pakistan was created in a bit of a hurry. Uh, the demand was made in 1940. The actual independence came in 47. There were only seven years None of the founders of Pakistan actually wrote a book. I mean, there's no book written by Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the, the great leader of Pakistan, which laid out what the country was going to be. It was basically like a political debate going on at that time. Aisha Jalal, the famous uh, Tufts historian also from Pakistan, has demonstrated in her book that as far as Mr. Jinnah was concerned, he was using the demand for Pakistan as a bargaining tool in a political situation so that he could get greater leverage for Muslims in a post-independence India. He, he didn't really have two states in mind. Um, the 1940 resolution calling for Pakistan actually spoke of more than one state for Muslims. It wasn't just Pakistan one. The name Pakistan wasn't even in that resolution. Uh, it was possibly 
different Muslim states emerging, which could have meant, you know, Sindh, Punjab, Baluchistan, Pashtunkhwa, uh, or Pashtunistan, and Bengal, East Bengal, emerging separately. And then, the early generation of Pakistan's leaders realized that the demand for Pakistan had its strongest support in areas that did not come into Pakistan. So the Muslims from the minority areas, because obviously they felt the prospects of their being uh, swamped by the majority far greater than those who were already in a majority. So they were, Mr. Jinnah was in Bombay, Liaquat Ali Khan, the first Prime Minister was from Karnal, which is now in Haryana, etc., etc. So the first generation of leaders was very few of them were from geographic Pakistan. So they started feeling ethnic tensions. People saying, you know what, yeah, we are all, all Muslim brothers and we've created this country together. But you're different from me. You speak a different language than I do. Then they had decided to make Urdu the national language, which in the 1951 census was the mother tongue of only 2% of the country's population. So, so to resolve all these contradictions, I call it, this is my, the first book, this is a long commercial break, but you have to understand the first book to understand the second, and then go on Amazon.com and order both. Uh, hardbound is better, it means, it, it, it means more royalties for, this, for, for, for the author. Um, hey, I've worked hard on the book, you know, you can at least buy it. Um, better yet, read it. Um, and so, Pakistan, of course, being in two wings, what is today Bangladesh, what is uh, the, the people of Bangladesh were in a majority in uni unified Pakistan, and their language was Bengali. And the first demand they said was, if we are the majority in the country, we are 53% of the population, why should Urdu, which is the language of 3%, be the national language? Tensions, ethnic tensions started emerging, and then, not while I'm not the conventional Pakistani who kind of engages in India bashing as his favorite pastime other than following, other than following the fortunes of the Pakistani cricket team and Imran Khan, <laughs> um, I do think that India's leaders did not deal with the situation appropriately and reasonably either. Once they had conceded, they should have done what Gandhi, who was the better of the Indian leaders, said. He said, okay, these are members of our family, they are leaving the family home and creating a home for themselves, we are going to try and be nice to them. In fact, Gandhi even went on a fast when the assets for Pakistan were being withheld by India. But the other Indian leaders were rather cussed about it, and I sometimes <coughs> joke about it, and I say if you want to, and especially to Americans who know very little about the region, I say, you want to understand the India-Pakistan relationship? Take a deep breath and imagine the worst divorced couple you know and then give them both nuclear weapons. <laughs> she can't forgive him for not letting him leave, uh, not letting her leave him uh, in a gentle, kind and generous way. He can't forgive her for walking out on him. And that's exactly the dynamic here. So the Indian leaders constantly used to say, especially in the first few years, several of them used to say, this is a temporary insanity, Pa the Pakistanis, after a few years, will realize and they'll rejoin Mother India, etc., etc. That helped create a psychosis, psychosis of insecurity in Pakistan. So, Pakistan, now, that was India. The rest of the world also was not particularly hospitable to the idea of Pakistan. I mean, if you read the Time magazine editorial, which I have done for my book now, you know, I've read, I've read, I've read, uh, by the way, the writing has improved considerably in American newspapers since, since, since 1947 and 48, and the headlines are a lot better, and so are the cartoons, uh, when cartoons are published. Um, and they, uh, they were very hostile to the idea. What's this idea? You, you're creating a land, you're creating a country for Muslims, but you're leaving one-third of the Muslims behind in India, and so you will have two entities with one-third, one-third, and then a third in India, and then these two entities, East and West Pakistan, separated by a thousand miles, how long will they remain one country? And lo and behold, that did happen. In 1971, East Pakistan chose to become Bangladesh. So the very raison d'etre of Pakistan, the concept of a Muslim homeland or an Islamic state for Muslims in South Asia, didn't really materialize because it ended up dividing the Muslims of South Asia, pre-partition Muslims of South Asia, into three different entities. So. My book, Pakistan Between Mosque and Military, explains that basically soon after partition, soon after independence, Pakistan's leaders came up with what I call Pakistan's policy tripod. First, 
that we will try to, re to unify our nation in the name of Islam. Islam will be the national unifier, giving a greater role to religion in, in, in contemporary politics of any country before Pakistan, uh, 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 any, any other country, until of course later others start. Pakistan was the first country to call itself an Islamic Republic, long before Iran, long before Mauritania or anybody else. Second, they came up with the, uh, 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 the concept that this state was very resource poor. Pakistan in the division got one third of the military of British India, but only 17% of its revenue sources. So 33% of the military, 17% of the, of the, of the uh, military. Sources. And so feeding that military became a big issue from day one. Now, if I had been around and had any authority or power, of course, I would have been shot dead within four days. But if I had survived, <laughs> I would have argued that we need to cut the military down. We can't pay for it. But that's not what was decided. What the decision that was taken was, we will turn to America. And America will become the source of revenue for us. And they will provide us the resources. And Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, in fact, uh, started making statements, and I'll read one of them for you uh, very interestingly, that, you know, the U.S. needs us, it needs us against the Soviet Union, and therefore uh, it should give us a lot of money. And the first demand was for $2 billion, B, billion with a B. And guess how much the Americans gave? $10 million with an M. So, again, if I was around, I would have said, hey, your expectation and the reality is far <laughs> apart review your expectation, but that didn't happen. What happened was new methods were, uh, uh, were, 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 were focused upon how to get America more entangled. So Islam, the national unifier, uh, the, uh, the, um, um, uh, the Americans as the, uh, 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 the paymasters for the country, and India as the existential enemy. This was the policy tripod. We will, and so everybody in everything, the, what will unite us as a nation is not a hopefulness about the future. What will unite us is not a vision for, you know what, we will become the first Muslim country to have emerged from colonial rule, which will end up with 100% literacy. No, none of that was talked about. It wasn't about, you know, our women are going to be uh, smarter and, 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 and assertive and they will be all over. Uh, no. The whole discourse was, how do we get more money from Uncle Sam? Why Islam is our national unifier? And boy, India is such a threat to us, we just need to keep building up our military. So that book deals with that whole subject, comes all the way to the Musharraf era, and how that tri policy tripod has functioned. And uh, if you read it, you will realize that that actually explains a lot about Pakistan. A lot that confuses a lot of people can actually be understood. Now, before I go into my second part, which is my second book, which is called Magnificent Delusions, Pakistan, United States, and an Epic Misunderstanding, I would like to point out that no one should misunderstand. Pakistanis are a wonderful people. It's a nation of very hardworking, people of great potential and great capability and hospitable to a fault. Which is why those of you who have Pakistani friends, you will realize that they are wonderful friends. So please, any analysis of the politi politics of it all should not make you think, oh God, you know, these people sort of, you know, what's, what's wrong with them? There's nothing wrong with Pakistanis. What you have is a national discourse. And that national discourse has not been changed primarily because most Pakistanis in the last 60 years that you are likely to have encountered, their own backgrounds are technical. They go and become, most Pakistanis, when I was a young guy, you know, I was asked, what do you want to become, a doctor or an engineer? And I said, neither, I want to go into political science. And everybody said, the kid's mad, <laughs> you know, uh, because it's doctors, it's engineers. But what does that do? What it does is, it doesn't allow you to understand social theories, etc., etc., and contending narratives. You absorb the national narrative, and loving the country means, in fact, I got a, 
uh, a nasty email from a from an AU alum saying, you know, I object to you being invited by AU because you know your views are da 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 da. As if I'm outside the pale. She's a former Pakistani, I mean, Pakistani former student of AU. And so, because obviously, the poor young woman, uh, sort of, you know, she studied accounting or whatever she studied here, she is not willing to understand that somebody can love Pakistan and have a different narrative about the country than the narrative she's been brought up on and can have a different vision for that country and still love the country. And, and, and that is something that is difficult for people to understand. What went wrong in the US-Pakistan relationship? Here's what went wrong. Americans have a tendency, and every time I used to meet American officials as ambassador, I always used to, I had brought it down to a one-liner, because Americans deal very well with one-liners. <laughs> and I said, look, Americans have to stop looking at the world as a problem to solve. They have to look at the world as a situation to understand. So Americans sometimes, like you go meet somebody who's a senior official, takes his position for the first time, knows nothing about your country, the ambassador is coming to meet him, and the first question he says is, what can we do for you? And I felt like saying, I'm not here to tell you what you can do for me, I'm here to tell you what is the situation between your country and mine. Understand that first, and then figure out if you want to do something, whether you should do something or whether you don't want to do something. The American desire to do something has ended up in a situation in which Pakistan has ended up being one of the largest recipients of American aid since 1948. Remember the $2 billion request being uh, followed by only $10 million? Well, the first few months, first few years, the first generation, especially uh, Harry Truman and Dean Acheson, who was the Secretary of State, they weren't too keen. They, they understood. They understood that Pakistan and the United States, we cannot be allies because Pakistan looks upon India as an enemy and America doesn't look upon India as an enemy. Pakistan, America's threat is communism or global communism and Pakistan is not seriously threatened by global communism at that particular point. Uh, there was no serious communist party in Pakistan. There was the Soviet Union wasn't even interested in Pakistan. The Soviet Union didn't even open an embassy in Pakistan for a long time. So. So after they got rebuffed on the $2 billion aid, the Pakistanis said, oh God, to get the Americans interested, first we have to get the Soviets interested. <laughs> so, so, so a lot of effort was put in into getting the Soviets sufficiently interested so that the Americans would get sufficiently interested. You know, I mean, I don't know how many, or especially the younger ones of you have ever done that. You know, I want really, I really want him to take me to the dance, but I'll hang out with him so that he starts wondering whether I should be the person that he could take with him. Anyway, usually that happens only, that only happens at the high school level, but this was happening at global levels. And so, and so the Pakistani leaders actually worked on that and started cultivating. And then there are two individuals in American history about whom someday I want to do more research and write books entirely about those two people because, you know, in fact one of them is the topic of a book of a friend of mine who used to work for the New York Times, a man called Stephen Kinzer, who also wrote a wonderful book about the fall of the Shah, uh, no, the restoration of the Shah in 1953. It's a book called All the Shah's Men and he's doing a work on the brothers, the, the two brothers, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles. And good old John Foster Dulles was thinking of ways to run rings around the Soviet Union and the emerging Communist Republic of China. And so he wanted bases all over the world. And he was looking at the world purely as a map. Who lived where, what they thought wasn't important. And there's a very funny episode about this, which I'm going to actually read from a biography of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Dulles's. And that is, uh, uh, I don't, yeah. So Dulles looked at the map and he said, we have to have bases in South Asia. Problem was, India's leader, Jawaharlal Nehru, was very harsh in making the decision that India will not side either with the Soviet Union or the United States. His view was that we are a newly independent country, we are coming out of the shackles of colonialism, we are going to be a new, we, we are going to be non-aligned. We will get what we can get from the Americans, we'll get what we can get from the Soviets, we'll do what we like, we are not going to be part of any of this international group, group business. And John Foster Dulles, who became Secretary of State with the election of President Eisenhower in 1952, 
and his brother became head of the CIA, they had a very kind of a black and white uh, approach to the world. You are with us or against us. Um, you are good or you are evil. And in fact, John Foster Dulles came up with a famous one-liner that, you know, I can't understand these guys who want to be neutral. How can you be neutral between the fire and the fire brigade? So he was totally, by the time he became Secretary of State, he was already totally annoyed with Nehru and with India. And Pakistanis, of course, were constantly quoting the United States, as I said, from 47 to 1952. They had been quoting, you know, you need us. You need us. We'll give you bases if you want. You should seek our help. We've got a strong military. That military needs to be further strengthened against us. We will be a bulwark. And the smart men in Washington, D.C., like Dean Acheson, were saying, uh 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 uh. They may have a strong military, and they may, but they are not our allies because they are not going to be fighting the same enemy. They are going to fight India whenever they get the weapons. So let's not give them weapons. And that whole thing happened till 52, but in 52, with Dulles coming into office, things changed. And this was Pakistan's great opportunity, or the Pakistani elite's great opportunity. Pakistan became a partner in two of the alliances that Dulles was creating. Of course, there was NATO already, which everybody, but he was creating something called Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. Except Pakistan was not in Southeast Asia. When you think of Southeast Asia, you think of Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines. Where does Pakistan belong? But none of those countries were willing to belong to Seattle. So Dulles needed somebody, you know, and he needed token uh, Asians. And so he got the Philippines and he got Pakistan. And those were the only two. <laughs> and, and so Walter Lippmann, the famous uh, columnist, he ran into Dulles at a party. And he said, and I'm going to read this from a biography of, uh, of, of Lippmann because it's a very interesting episode. Look, Walter, Dulles said, I've got to get some fighting men into the south of Asia. The only Asians who can really fight are the Pakistanis. That's why we need them in the alliance. We could never get along without the Gurkhas. But Foster, Lipman countered, the Gurkhas aren't Pakistanis. <laughs> they are Indians. Of course, he was also wrong. The Gurkhas are essentially Nepalese. <laughs> uh, Dallas replied, well, who cares about such details? They may not be Pakistanis, but they are Muslims. Lipman said, no, I'm afraid they are not Muslims either. They are Hindus. <laughs> At this point, the Secretary of State said, no matter what we want is an ally and we have one. Thank God for it. So this is how the alliance came about. That this was like, we'll have an ally, let's thank God for it. But soon, it ran into difficulties. Um, the United States wanted troops for Korea. Pakistan wasn't willing to do that. Uh, troops for Vietnam. Pakistan wasn't willing to do that. Pakistan asked for X amount of military equipment, etc., etc. It was provided with it. The bases that it had offered originally, the, 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 the basis offer was withdrawn on grounds that our people don't like the Americans. So how can we do that? And that was the beginning. Then by 1965, of course, things became really bad. Pakistan, by now, totally armed and equipped by American equipment, went to war with India against American warnings, against American uh, assertions that if you do that, we will cut off aid to both sides. But India is not such a major recipient of our military aid, but if we cut it off to you, you will be badly affected. And since 65, things have never been the same. It's been a yo-yo relationship, up and down, up and down, etc. Then came the war against the Soviets. In Afghanistan, Pakistan allowed itself to be the staging base, huge war. Soviet, uh, the Mujahideen were armed to fight, and they came from all over the world, including from Arabia, people like Bin Laden, etc. That's how they showed up in the region to fight the Soviets. Once the Soviet Union collapsed, again, there was a parallel thing going on. Pakistan was developing nuclear weapons capability primarily in response to India's nuclear capability. And the United States chose to look the other way, but once 
the United States' need ended, the United States withdrew from the region. And so this, re this relationship, this alliance, has remained consistently troubled. And here is what my conclusion, not conclusion of the talk, but my conclusion about the relationship yeah. is. My conclusion is that the real reason is that alliances need a shared enemy or a shared objective. In case of Pakistan and the United States, that has not been evolved. Some of us in Pakistan would want Pakistan's worldview to be more aligned with that of the United States, because we think that is in Pakistan's interest. It's not about America's interest. Pakistanis should make decisions in Pakistan's interest, and Americans should make decisions in America's interest. But what has been happening is that both sides have been making short-term quid pro quo deals and calling them an alliance. And that doesn't work because it creates dissatisfaction. On the, hand, on the one hand, Pakistanis, for example, are consistently dissatisfied with, and, and, and I, you know, for my new book, I'm reading stuff going back to the 40s. You'll be amazed. When do you think the first anti American demonstration took place in Pakistan? Take a wild guess. Anybody? Just a year. Any year. Pick a year. Ah, you're being over clever here. Uh, you know, that's just because Pakistan was created in 47, so it must have been fine. But, but based on what you know of U.S.-Pakistan relations. 54. 54. A more educated uh, view than when Pakistan and America. Actually, 1948. And, and the American embassy at that time was a very small embassy. In fact, the embassy in, in Karachi, which was the capital at that time, was smaller than the American embassy in Cuba in 1948. And that small embassy was able to understand one thing. They said, look, every time we talk to the Pakistanis, whenever we suggest that we want to be neutral in the battle between, or the conflict between India and Pakistan, they accuse us of being pro-Indian. They also often accuse us of being pro-Israel. And they often accuse us of being anti-Islam. All the three things that today seem magnified and big, if you see the pictures of demos, etc., etc., and the Pakistani area, the seeds go back very early on. And here is the reason. The reason is that Pakistan needs an ally for its regional issues. It has a fear of India, some real, some perceived. It has a concern about Afghanistan, some real, some perceived. Real because Afghanistan refused in the beginning to recognize the Durand line or the part border between the two countries. Uh, perceived because very frankly in the 65 and 71 wars Afghanistan sided with Pakistan and not with India. So really this notion that somehow Afghanistan will allow large numbers of Indian troops to attack Pakistan from both sides and all of that has become redundant with nuclear weapons anyway. Once you have nuclear weapons, <coughs> why do you have to worry about a pincer attack from two sides, because now you have de a, de a deterrent, so you should have a more mature approach. But that is not possible given the sentimental discourse of foreign policy in Pakistan. People like me, when we have tried to try and debate the issues and frame it differently, we've been called everything from traitors to disloyal to the state to cons conspirators against the country, etc., etc., which none of us are. We are offering a different foreign policy vision. So the U.S.-Pakistan relationship is at its lowest now, especially after the bin Laden, uh, uh, after bin Laden being found in Pakistan. Um, soon after that event, a poll was taken in the United States, and 74 percent of Americans said Pakistan was not an ally of the United States. 74 percent. Pakistanis returned the favor. They have done it repeatedly. But right there and then, 74% of Pakistanis said the United States is an enemy of Pakistan. Okay? Now, in a democratic environment, how can two countries be allies when 74% of their respective populations does not trust the other country? That needs to either change or reality accepted that the alliance is not feasible. Um, Ironically, 75% of Americans have a positive view of India compared to only 15% of Americans having a favorable view of Pakistan. 
So from Pakistan's point of view, and I keep reminding everybody I'm a Pakistani. So as a Pakistani, I'm saying from Pakistan's point of view, none of this lead, uh, 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 ends up painting a positive picture of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship's future. Now, the U.S. does need Pakistan, for example, for withdrawal of troops <coughs> and equipment from Afghanistan. Pakistan is a logistical area. But logistical needs are short term. They are not the basis of relationships and alliances. They cannot be. It is a wrong notion to think that logistical needs or technical needs at a given moment will somehow make two countries into longer term allies. Just think about it. Did, and did, did you guys read the story in the Washington Post not long ago about 54 countries that helped the United States immediately after 9-11 with rendition, finding people and guess who was included in that list? Iran, Syria, yeah. you know? Um, so, so these are countries that are not necessarily foreign policy allies of the United States and yet they were helping in this particular instance. Uh, Pakistan was too. India and Israel, who are supposed to be America's longer term allies, were not part of the rendition program. They did not facilitate that. Israel never said, you know what, send some of those Arabs, we'll torture them for you. <laughs> they refused. India didn't do that either. You know? So my point being that this logistical and short term arrangements can be reached between all kinds of countries. It doesn't make for an alliance. A genuine alliance has to be based on a shared enemy or a shared worldview. That is not emerging. For example, after $40 billion that have been put into Pakistan and US aid, Pakistan's economy still is not a very performing economy. Compare that with Taiwan, which has had, as in the same period, Taiwan has had something like Hold on, let me find the figure. I remember this figure, but I'm forgetting it right now. Okay, so Taiwan has received only $8 billion in American aid over the years. South Korea, $15 billion. Taiwan and South Korea, for Pakistanis in particular, and those Americans who have Pakistani friends, it's an important question for you to think about. Why is it that South Korea was able to convert $15 billion of assistance into an economic miracle that makes it one of the largest economies or significant economies in Asia. Taiwan's GDP is something around $900 billion after about $8 billion of aid. And Pakistan, on the other hand, is still struggling as an economy. Something's gone wrong. And that something wrong is an internal issue of Pakistan for which I will come to when we have questions and answers. But the big picture question. So where does Pakistan and where do Pakistan and the United States go? My point is that the hostility that is between Pakistan and the United States is not a temporary phenomenon now. The Bin Laden uh, uh, discovery in Pakistan has made Pakistan part of the American sort of deeper... Uh, 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 Pakistan has penetrated the American awareness. 10, 15 years ago, you know, pa yeah, Pakistan was a subject, it, there was a news story about it, but only people in the State Department, people in the Pentagon, few people in Congress, some people in academia, those whose careers were, were associated with it, they bothered about Pakistan. Just after the Bin Laden raid, I was still ambassador, I can tell this anecdote, I went and saw a congressman and he comes from a rural constituency in the southern United States. I shall not take the name of his town because that will then help you identify who he is. And he said to me, Ambassador, you and I have been friends for years. And I have often been sympathetic to Pakistan, but here's my problem. Previously I used to vote for aid for Pakistan and I had no problems. Nobody in my district ever worried about it. They questioned me over my vote on this and that and that, but never questioned me on my foreign aid vote. This time when I went there, people asked me, what is your view on, pa on Pakistan, as he pronounced it. <laughs> and he said, Pakistan is now, now if in, and he took the name of his small town, and he said, if people are talking about Pakistan in this, this, this town in Alabama, then Mr. Ambassador, it's going to be very difficult for many of us in Congress 
to continue to have the old attitude that the State Department comes, Assistant Secretary of State makes a nice presentation, White House says, yeah, 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 why the heck not, and you, we approve a couple of billion dollars in aid for Pakistan. It's not going to happen easily. Movies like Zero Dark Thirty, I've seen a lot of stuff, especially on Twitter from Pakistanis who find it objectionable. Of course, there are, there are many mistakes in it. You know, in areas where Punjabi should be spoken, people are speaking Arabic. In areas where uh, uh, Urdu should be spoken, people are speaking Pashto, etc., etc. Stuff like that happens uh, in Hollywood. Uh, those who want accuracy in Hollywood uh, should uh, sort of, you know, uh, 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 revisit their notions about what Hollywood is essentially for. Hollywood is for, <laughs> Hollywood is for entertainment and... Uh, uh, TV news is for news. Ironically, the lines are blurred. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the, 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 the awareness of the average American about Pakistan is now in a negative mode. And it needs to be protected, it needs to be saved. There. Both countries want friendly relations with each other, and they should have it. But for that, it is important either the United States changes its view on South Asia, and recognizes Pakistan's desire for preeminence and says Afghanistan be damned, India be damned, Pakistan is it. And that play, play, paves the way for a stronger uh, 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 alliance. I don't see that realistically happening <laughs> because America's economic relations are far greater with India. America is now after investment in Afghanistan. Americans have a better understanding and a relationship with Afghanistan. And last but not least, the antipathy and negativity, there's always a limit. I mean, you know, I pride myself in being a very patient man, but there are moments when I get very angry at being abused. And so I can see the same happening on both sides. And the game is outside the hands of diplomats. So hence my suggestion, which will come in, and, uh, in, in my book as well as in a couple of long articles that are about to come, that Pakistan and the United States should get out of the trap of describing themselves as an alliance. There are many things you can do. You know, it's, the choice in life is not simply between killing someone or going to bed with them. There's dozens of things you can do in between. And Pakistan and the United States need to explore those. Things that they can do normal relationship elements that they can build slowly so that some trust can be created between the two countries. Lastly, it is important for Pakistan to make some decisions for Pakistan's sake. Rhetorically and in argument, it's very valid for Pakistanis to say Pakistan has lost more people in the war against terror than Americans have been killed. However, however, that does not change the fact that Pakistan remains home to many, many, many jihadist extremist groups. And the Pakistani state has a long way to go in putting them down and putting them out of business. So a Pakistan that they, they're just simple things. If I, if I do a random survey, who in this room thinks Dr. A.Q. Khan, the Pakistani nuclear scientist, is a hero? Who in this room thinks Dr. A.Q. Khan, the Pakistani nuclear scientist, is a criminal? But the others have no opinion, boy, <laughs> you can't win. <laughs> Similarly, who thinks that the Mujahideen, the, the jihadi groups like lashkar e taiba and jesh e Muhammad, etc., etc., responsible for various terrorist events, are heroes? Who thinks that they are criminals? So my point is that this gap that the people who are seen um, and I'm not going to even embarrass you with the last question, you know, who thinks I'm a nice guy and who thinks, and who thinks, and who thinks I should be executed, you know, uh, I won't even put it. The fact that there is this huge gap, that people who are seen in Pakistan as heroes are seen globally as criminals and people who are seen as respectable people globally are seen as criminals or, 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 or not even criminals because they never charge anybody with anything but are treated as people who should be executed on demand, uh, that gap alone should suffice to show how this is no longer a functioning alliance. A new relationship needs to be created in which these gaps need to be overcome and Pakistan needs to make certain changes in its own internal 
uh, approach to things. Jihad, terrorism, extremism has to be finished off for Pakistan's sake. More Pakistanis get killed by it than Americans in Pakistan. Lastly, the United States does have a choice. I mean, there are people in this town, you know, because they've been doing it too long. Sometimes you repeat something enough, you start believing it. Oh, well, we need Pakistan. Of course you need Pakistan. But Pakistan needs you too. And unless and until this relationship is based on mutual respect, mutual acceptance, and not in a, 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 a manipulation of one another, this relationship will need what I call a post-alliance future. Post-alliance because the alliance is over and what comes next has yet to evolve. I'll stop here. I want questions because that will help me uh, sort of share more of my views. Just stand up, tell me who you are and, you know, uh, what you, whether you're a student, member of the faculty, what are you studying, and then, and then frame a question. If you want to give a speech, ask a you to schedule it for you next time. <laughs> so let's, keep it, let's keep it down to questions right now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Amy Anderson. I'm uh, the Symphony Chair of Water Studies Program Coordinator here at U. And my question for you is, would you consider the U.S. drone program in the Frontier Province part of an alliance between Pakistan and the U.S.? First of all, I think that the Pakistani government has the right to decide whether uh, the drone program in Pakistan takes place with its permission or without it. So any actions that are taken inside Pakistan without Pakistani government permission are a violation of Pakistani sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And there's a valid complaint there. But there's another part to it, which President Obama used to make very clear to us when we used to meet him. Now, when I meet, met him as, 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 as an <coughs> and he used to say that the threat to, our, to American security, if it emanates from a region, which you do not control, then you already do not exercise your sovereignty there anyway. So I don't know how many people remember, I got into a lot of trouble for saying a lot of <laughs> things, but this was one of them. I said, Pakistan's sovereignty was violated not just by the United States when they went inside Pakistan and killed Osama bin Laden. It was being constantly violated by Osama bin Laden by being present in Pakistan and running a global terrorist campaign out of Pakistan. <laughs> so Pakistanis, if we are going to be, as Pakistanis, if we are going to be sensitive to our national sovereignty, we also have to be sensitive to exercising that sovereignty so that it does not threaten other nations' with security. And that is how it should be seen. Now, on a side note, when I teach class, I often do this, you know, I say, this is a side note, this is a footnote, you know, not main. Look, the drone program is a very complicated issue in American policy. And Americans love to pick on some issue and, you know, uh, and, and, and then sort of divide it and it becomes a liberal, conservative issue. I mean, I've never yet been able to understand why sort of, you know, the please don't get a wrong impression and don't take this debate in that I mean, As a foreigner who's lived in this country for a while, I never understood why abortion is such an important political issue rather than just a cultural and family issue for people to discuss at homes, you know. I mean, I'd rather sit my daughters down and talk to them about this as a home matter and a family matter rather than this being a huge political issue. But then American politics is American politics, and I'm sure Americans are equally frustrated and find, find Pakistani politics e equally con confusing, you know. Um, so the drones have now become a political issue. It's a right, it's a right. The truth of the matter is that the war against terrorism by definition, requires rules very different to conventional war. Because conventional wars were fought between armies that had uniforms, that had chains of command that were announced and declared. You knew who was who. Terrorists don't announce so-and-so is a four-star, so-and-so is a three-star. So I mean, the Geneva Convention for Prisoners of War actually tells what will be the treatment of officers, what will be the treatment of generals, or, because it's all laid down. How can you, or some editorial writers in certain newspapers in this country, confuse the issue and say that the rules of war, regular war, should apply to the rules of irregular warfare? 
So when the enemy is irregular, the solutions and the war itself is going to end up being irregular. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Rasmus Farooq, and uh, I'm from Pakistan. Uh, I'm currently serving as a diplomat right here on the National Service Program for the Bright Spot. I beg your pardon? I'm uh, in the International Service Program and the School of Bright Spot. Sir, uh, first of all, congratulations for a very fascinating speech, and you know, I, even I learned many things new and uh, fresh from your speech. And uh, secondly, I just want to uh, make one simple comment on the this transition sort of relationship between US and the Pakistan person. It is like a joke that moves on. That if uh, uh, Pakistanis, they like, you know, complain uh, of getting a divorce in a very humiliation, you know, every time they come across that point. And that divorce uh, humiliatingly. The Americans, they can draw an analogy of a girl who chases a man up to the church and then complain the gunpoint marriage, you know, in, in, in that context. Well, I hope you know that what you are repeating is actually something that the third uh, Governor General of Pakistan, Ghulam Muhammad, said to the then Secretary of State. This was his line. Yes. That, oh God, we are chasing you, 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 everybody thinks we are courting you and you are not giving us what we want. So, um, unfortunately, uh, marriage and courtship analogies only go thus far in international relations. <laughs> selectivity is practiced in international relations. For instance, now, I mean, throughout uh, the history of both the countries, the problem comes when the, U the U.S. chooses to uh, have transactions with the military setup inside Pakistan. You can take the example of 1979. I mean, previously, after 65 war, after that, yes, so we never enjoyed good relationship for almost you know, 30, 40 years. And then after that, jihad began. Then again, the same, you know, the, the aid started flowing in Pakistan, and then again, the problem of extremism and terrorism started, you know, uh, there and then, and these extremists, they... You said your name was Azmat, right? Azmat, sir. Okay. So, Azmat, I hope you know Urdu, sir. and there's a couplet in Urdu by Iqbal, sir. which I will read for you, and then we'll take the next question, and I'll translate it for those who do not. He says, Europe ki gulami pe raza mand hua tu, mujko to gila tutse hai, Europe se nahi hai. That... <laughs> That those of you, those of you who keep complaining about Europe's domination, you were the one who accepted that domination, so I should complain against you, not them. My point being, the army is also Pakistan's army, and if it chooses to do these transactional relationships every few years, we Pakistanis must take responsibility instead of blaming the Americans. The objective of American foreign policy should be protecting Americans' interests. American interests and Pakistan's objective should be protecting Pakistan's interest. And if, if Pakistan does not allow an open debate about what is Pakistan's interest, then the problem lies in Pakistan, not in U.S.-Pakistan relations. Thank you. Yes. Come again. The name? It's Bali. Mm -hmm. I'm from India. Yep, yep. Uh, from your speech, I gather that it's a very fair that the relationship between U.S. and Pakistan has. Like you said, it's based on short-term alliances. Uh, do you think uh, the relationship between China and Pakistan is far more convincing given the fact that they are common enemies? Okay, here's the point. <laughs> Pakistan and China are like like, like the friend that the, the, who, who do not have a whose relationship is not as vast and deep but it also has no issues. So, you know, I invite you for dinner, you show up, uh, occasionally you bring a bottle of wine, occasionally you don't, etc., etc. We are both nice to e each other, and that makes me think, wow, what a nice friend. Um, the, because we never argue, we never have issues. And China, the, the truth of the matter is that in terms of assistance, China has never given the kind of assistance to Pakistan that the United States has done. In terms of investment, China's investment in Pakistan is very... Uh, skin deep compared to the investment in, uh, in uh, of the United States. Uh, there are no pa large number of Pakistanis living in China. There is almost a million Pakistani Americans, you know, who have uh, about a little over half of whom have U.S. citizenship. So, but 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 the Chinese are good at this of making people feel good. Americans are a little difficult that way, you know. Americans. Americans have, you know, Americans do everything with a lot of noise. Uh, the, 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 the affection is shown with a lot of noise, and then the anger is shown with a lot of noise, 
and then everything ends up becoming, first of all, everything gets leaked in the papers, then movies get made about it, <laughs> and etc., etc., etc. So the embarrassment is far greater, and the, uh, and the expectations are far greater. The Chinese don't allow the discourse and the relationship to go too far out. If your question has a side question about what does Hussein Haqqani think about Pakistan's longer term foreign policy objective. Pakistan needs American capital. Pakistan needs American know-how. There are few, fewer Pakistani students in American universities today, despite the showering of uh, Fulbrights on Pakistan. Pakistan is one of the largest Fulbright recipients right now from the US government. Yet, there are fewer Pakistani students in American universities than Nepalese students, although Nepal's population is only one-sixth of the size of Pakistan. Um, uh, the Pakistan, 48% of school-going age children in Pakistan don't go to school. Yet Pakistan is a nuclear weapons power, etc. Those are the internal contradictions of Pakistan, which we just don't get to debate if you watch Pakistani television, which, by the way, is uh, available here on DISH. I don't watch it because my doctor said my blood pressure is more important. <laughs> so I don't watch it anymore. You know, since I resigned as ambassador, I, 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 I've never watched Pakistani television. But the debate there is always about America, America this, India this, you know, Zionism this, fala. Nobody's talking about that 48% of the school going age children of a very young population. Half of Pakistan's population is below the age of 21. That means 90 million people under the age of 21. 48% of whom will not see the inside of any kind of school. Take out the people who are going to madrasas. Their education is irrelevant to the modern world. Then take out those who are being taught only this historic narrative about, you know, we are the greatest, we were born with a particular mission, we were da 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 da, and no practical know-how. You actually have potential for significant failure down the road. None of that happens. In that situation, Pakistan needs to have functioning relations with all its neighbors. We need to have gas pipelines coming from Iran through Pakistan into India, from Turkmenistan through Afghanistan into Pakistan into India, because India is a gas, uh, uh, is, a, is an energy short country. We need trade with India, which is open and vast. We need to become a trading nation that takes advantage of sitting at the crossroads of some of the most important regions of the world. We sit at the crossroads of India, China, Central Asia, and the Middle East. Instead, what we have done is, or our leaders have done is, they have made us sit at the crossroads of conflicts. Mm -hmm. We need to transform this from conflict to opportunities. And that's what we need to do. We need to have good relations with China. We need to have even better relations with India. and working good relations with the United States. And this ideological debate about who's our friend, who's our enemy, who's our, this needs to end. Famous Lord Palmerston saying, there are no permanent friends and enemies in international relations, just interest. Have a honest debate inside Pakistan about what is Pakistan's interest? Is it building tactical nuclear weapons? Or is it building more schools for those 48% children who don't go to school. That is the debate that should be had in Pakistan, which unfortunately is not allowed by the powers that be. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kyle Hayes, and I'm a member of the community here. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the Bin Laden countdown and what extent you think that the ISI or other elements have knowledge, or to what extent he's protected, if it was just several individuals or more institutionalized. Now, the last time I spoke about it, I got stripped of my ambassadorship. <laughs> I, ended up, I ended up sitting in the basement at the Prime Minister's house for two and a half months awaiting trial. And now you want me to talk about it again. Wow, who, who are you working for? Um, okay, look, the point is Pakistan has to answer this question. It's, we, can't, we can't shrug our shoulders and say that, you know, it happened. Stuff happens. Well, if stuff happens, give an explanation. Somebody help them. That somebody may not be in the state or the government. And I personally believe that the chances that it was somebody high up in the government is much less, in fact, nil. It wasn't in anybody's interest. It was not in the interest of the Pakistani military or the intelligence service or the government to help Bin Laden stay in Pakistan. It was not. 
the person from the embassy who's taking notes should underline the not, make it in capital, um, so that they know that I said that. However, <laughs> however, however, it is important to understand that nobody stays somewhere unless they think they are safe there, and there is a protection network. So that network needs to be found, identified, and broken down. And the fact that it hasn't been done, the fact that no science, nobody has been found responsible, no group has been disbanded, really does not make the world feel very comfortable. Secondly, a very reasonable, plausible explanation is that there are certain groups in Pakistan that enjoy more or less protection. Not Al-Qaeda, but other groups. Jihadi groups, Lashkar-e Taiba, Jaisya Muhammad, Hizbul Mujahideen, Harkat al Mujahideen, all these jihadi groups. Now, Taliban, some groups of Taliban. These guys looked upon bin Laden as a hero. Is it possible that they were the ones who helped protect him? And if they were, why can't the Pakistani state act against them? So it's like me being protective of this lady here, and then she says, you know what, I've got a couple of guests coming, you know, I, I, I get a house, invite her to stay there, then she gets a couple of guests coming there, etc. Et but why should Pakistan be such a weak state that the terrorist whose name is in a UN resolution and who, uh, uh, finding whom is a global uh, uh, target, that we are unable to do anything about finding him, and then when he's found, we are incapable of finding the people who help. That is a question that Pakistan, as a state, as a government, and our intelligence service, and our military, and our civilian law enforcement agencies all need to answer. The answer that, oh gosh, you know, stuff happens in Pakistan. I mean, they're friends of mine, they've come here, in your friends. Very good, intelligent people. One of them gave a speech here and he said, but you see in Pakistan there are these big housing compounds. Now the government can't go and look into each housing compound. You know? And I said, with all due respect, if I was living in one of those housing compounds right now, I bet you would find me. <laughs> if Benadir Bhutta had been living in one of them when she was, when she was looked upon as the enemy by the, by the uh, intelligence services, they would have found her. You know? So why couldn't you find this guy? Please come up with an answer. And that's all I'm going to say to you on that one. Yes, ma'am. I'm uh, Gretchen Peters. We've met before. Of course, Gretchen. Uh, and, um, it was good to see you when you yeah. walked in. <laughs> I, um, I can say as a, as a six foot tall foreigner who lived in Pakistan for 11 years and tried to sneak around quite a lot as a journalist, it is impossible. <laughs> but anyway, that's just a side Yeah, point. yeah. I wanted to ask you, I'm, I'm quite interested. Hey, I'm a five foot seven and three quarters inch Pakistani. <laughs> <laughs> and, I haven't, and I haven't found it easy to walk around without the intelligence people knowing exactly where I went and what I did. But so I'm it is, yeah. Tall and foreign, the Pakistani, the, the Pakistani not, Stasi, the Pakistani Stasi knows. You know, they have elaborate files. Every speech I give these days, there's somebody who's taking notes there that go into the file, you know, so I can't believe that nobody knew. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, what I wanted to ask about, the, the, there's a, there's a, a newish program by the Pakistan military to try and de-radicalize, particularly some of the big Punjabi Taliban groups, Lashkari Taiba, Jaishi Mohammed, Lashkari Jangri. Uh, and I'm wondering what you think about the chances for that. I've heard uh, Pakistan military officials talk about this you know, trying to turn them into something akin to Sinn Féin that would come into the political system the way uh, um, Kazi Saab and others did. Look, first of all, Kali Saab and others were already in the political system. They, they created a radical wing <laughs> after. They have a long history. They have a long history going back to 1941. Second, the largest operation that Pakistan's intelligence service has is its media operation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've lived in Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. You can see how the media is. So this is another story. I mean, I was very amused to see the New York Times played the other day. You know, made this guy who got all these people killed in Mumbai sound like a teddy bear. You know? My point is that if it is foot soldiers who are to be converted, yes, I'm all for DDR. I'm all for demobilization, um, disarmament, and reintegration. All 
groups, non-state groups at the end of conflict need to be put through that process. But if the process is just to showcase for foreigners and is not a substantive process, then it is not going to bring results. The real problem right now in Pakistan is how these groups keep morphing. You know, my, I don't know, I had a son and he was a great, when, when he was a young little boy, he used to watch something called Power Rangers. <laughs> So I had to watch it with him uh, a couple of times, a few times. And so I understand, you know, how these power rangers, they used to morph into different things. So in Pakistan, I mean, you start as Harkatul Ansar, then you morph into Harkatul Mujahideen, then you morph into... This morphing, why is it so difficult to put them out of business? Some of these people need to be tried for murder. If not for the murders they commit across the border, the murders they commit inside the country. Let us be very honest. Malik you know, huh? Malik Ishaq admitted to Malik Ishaq, television. Public, television he speak, he gives speeches <laughs> saying, "I have killed so many Shias," you know, and I am proud of it because they are not. And the state and the Supreme Court of Pakistan and the judges of Pakistan turn around and say there is no evidence. When has lack of evidence ever dissuaded them from being able to? <laughs> <laughs> to put somebody on trial. I mean, easiest thing for them is to ask the DGISI to put in a phone call to Mansoor Ijaz and he can be the witness and that is enough for them to send anybody to the gallows. So this is a circus that needs to stop for the sake of Pakistan. These are, and, and Americans, because you see, you're, you're, the problem in this country is you don't have institutional memory in anywhere. I mean, when I meet State Department people today, I have to tell them, oh, by the way, look for this. You know, this happened in 1996. They've never read it. There's no like, you know, when I was, I remember my best experience was at age 32, I became Pakistan's ambassador to Sri Lanka. So 32 year old is like, not a very sort of experienced or whatever. But, but one of the most interesting things was for me, they gave me this huge folder of everything that my predecessors as ambassadors had ever written on Pakistan-Sri Lanka relations. Mm -hmm. And so I read this stuff that went back to 1948. You know, I mean, I was the kind who read, but maybe others don't, but it existed. In your government, people don't know that. How many times the same story has been sold, Gretchen? Research that. Because in 1993, the same story was told. That uh, actually we are working on these guys and they're about to shut down and all the camps are being shut down and all that. The real decision when it's taken that the jihad is over and it's not in Pakistan's interest and that Pakistan will pursue its claims on Kashmir through political and diplomatic means and not through militants, that decision will be so obvi obvious and open that Commodore Zafar Iqbal will not have to do a PR job on you to try and get you to write about it. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, I'll come to you. I'm waiting for the active military sure. I have a question about the, how I understand you're not only an ambassador and haven't been for a while, but the, surely you still have your contacts in, in the government of, in Pakistan. Their view of, uh, you talk about the militant groups, 2014, the, the much demanded by a lot of people at presence in Afghanistan will likely come to an end to address military. These groups now lose that external target focus of their operations and their, and their jihad. What is, in your mind, Pakistan's assessment of that threat now, having spent 12 years going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the number one, right, one of the leading armies in the world, if you will, with no one else to turn to but against Pakistan? We'll have to have a longer conversation at it, which may, have, which may take up more time than what we can have here. But in a nutshell, let me say that Pakistan government right now has three different views and perceptions on it. There are those on the civilian side who think we should help the uh, government in Afghanistan come to some kind of an agreement with the Afghan Taliban groups and then use force, sufficient force against Pakistani Taliban groups to actually create a, um, a, a, a new order in which the, the, the various militant groups are no longer as effective and powerful as they used to. There are those who think uh, that we will need the, the militant groups 
up until 2014, but after that, uh, we can actually get all the uh, various Taliban groups, including the Pakistani Taliban, focused on Afghanistan and not be focused on Pakistan. And then third, there are people who think that we don't need to change anything. Eventually, Pakistan's regional <coughs> supremacy, if it is to emerge, will emerge as a result of a mixture of a nuclear uh, capability and a um, subconventional warfare capability. And yes, some of these boys are stupid, and they do stupid things sometimes, but by and large, they are still a useful tool for the long term. That, in a fair, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's why this is the moment when I should ask for coffee. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, young lady, uh, back. My name is Erica Duenia. I'm a master's program here, so I'm for policy. I was wondering if you could speak more on the conflict between President Jedi and the Supreme Court and how that affects the stability of Actually, I shouldn't speak on that for the simple reason that tomorrow there's a hearing in the Supreme Court that relates to me, so I don't want this to be narrated to the Chief Justice to a point where he loses his cool and actually sort of gives some, some, some order that makes my life a little more difficult. But in a nutshell, look, it's a power struggle. It's been obvious, if you read, if even with the slightest knowledge, the Chief Justice became very popular because of the campaign to restore him. Uh, as a result, he stopped being a officer of the law and started looking at himself as a player. Uh, he has a very, um, shall we say, self-righteous streak. He thinks that he knows best, he knows right, etc., etc. For example, look at what he did. I mean, I remember seeing him socially many years ago and I said, sir, this pursuit of the Swiss cases, I hope you realize the Swiss are never going to reopen those cases because Swiss law doesn't allow a criminal case once shut to be reopened. Um, and secondly, have you even checked the statute of limitations on it? And the third is the question of immunity. So three legal questions from somebody who did not finish law school. And he arrogantly said, no, 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 this is about principle and all that. So he wasted four and a half years of time doing that. With he, has, uh, he doesn't like President Zazari. He probably genuinely believes that President Zazari represents a uh, political class that he disagrees with. He's an urban, lower middle class person. Now, Pakistan's big political divisions, in my opinion, are um, uh, Islamist, non-Islamist, then ethnic, then urban rural, then civil military, you know. So these are the four major sort of, you know, uh, conflicts in Pakistan. And in this particular case, the Chief Justice represents three rolled into one. He's an urban guy. He's from Punjab, ethnically, although he, 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 will, he, he grew up in Baluchistan. And then uh, he is, has more sympathies for an Islamic Pakistan rather than for a secular Pakistan. And Zardari is on the opposite side of all three. You know? So Zardari represents rural interests, he represents, he comes from Sin. And, and so it's very easy for people to convince themselves, but we are not against Zardari because he's a Sindhi, but we are against him because he's corrupt. But, 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 but there is an element of all of that going on as well. So he has consistently done that, but the good news is that his fellow judges don't go along with him beyond a certain threshold. So it's been a debilitating debate, but I think in the end, very frankly, President Zardari has won. I mean, he's lasted all this time. He hasn't allowed him to be oust himself to be ousted. He's brought the country to a point where a second election can be held and uh, 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 his replacement can be an elected leader. Um, and the army cannot wait, cannot stage a coup, but it can help the chief justice move in a certain direction. But the chief justice's problem is if he, if he, if he leans too much in the army's camp, too blatantly, then he loses whatever respect and credibility he built by standing up to Musharraf. So he has to straddle all that. The good news of all of this is that, in a way, nations go through all this. I mean, your country went through all this, you know, um, before uh, Justice Marshall, you didn't have judicial review. So a chief justice said there has to be judicial review. That's how it started, remember? Similarly, uh, uh, Marbury versus Madison, uh, so, so under President Madison. So for first, for first four presidents, no judicial review.
fifth president of the Judicial Review Council. So in a way it's a good thing that we are having this, the executive branch, the judicial branch, and, and we need to come out of the long shadow of our military which has been seen as the savior by some uh, and has ended up being the problem generator by and large. Somebody who's had their hand up for a long time. Yes, sir. Sorry. Well, my name is Billy, I'm an ambassador. Uh, I'm a student in international relations. I'm all with you. Can we see you today? That's very really kind of you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, understand that the Pakistani government is going to include its full five year term uh, very soon. And I wonder what you thought the outcome for elections. Well, I hope that elections go ahead. I think it's going to be a closely contested election. Pakistan having a parliamentary system of government, it'll be a seat by seat fight in many cases. So the so the uh, beauty contest figures that you get are not necessarily the ones. But I think Imran Khan's party will have a reasonable showing this time compared to the past. Uh, uh, Nawaz Sharif's party will have an influence showing, and I don't see any erosion in the deep base of the Pakistan People's Party. Uh, even though some of the parties, people may have reservations or questions about performance, but they also understand the constraints. Uh, then the regional parties will remain players, MQM and ANP. The art of compromise is what will determine the future of Pakistan. How well can Pakistan's politicians and permanent states, uh, permanent institutions of state, the military, the civil service and the judiciary, how far can they all compromise and gradually move forward. Pakistan has lost. Look, India got independence the same day as Pakistan in 1947 and they had a constitution by 1949. 26th of January 1951 was when they had their constitution implemented. Pakistan got its first constitution in 56. That got scrapped in within two years. No, no, two years. 58, martial law. Then a second constitution in 62 scrapped again. Third constitution in 73, put into abeyance by General Ziaul in 77, well until 1988, then restored with massive amendments unilaterally introduced by Ziaul Haq, then put into abeyance by Musharraf, then restored with again massive amendments, etc. So Pakistan has never had the process. And very frankly, I mean, I am, you know, have a child who, whom you don't allow to walk and the kid when he finally does get to walk will walk with some kind of deformity or difficulty and that's what Pakistan is going through right now. So if the process moves forward and is not interrupted either by the judiciary or by the military and we have an election, I think whatever the outcome of the election, we will at least have a process going forward. Tahir al-Qadri is not going to be an electoral factor, but he is going to be a non-electoral factor. Pakistan has electoral people who are electable and people who aren't electable, a bit like this country, you know. So, I mean, I would see Tahir al-Qadri as a kind of a Ralph Nader character in <laughs> Pakistan's politics. Uh, he could end up, if he puts up candidates, he could end up uh, giving some seats to one party or the other, depending on whose votes he takes away. But, I, but, but he's more of a uh, more of a issue generator rather than a vote getter. We've seen it take votes away from the last three, maybe. Yeah. Imran Khan too, by the way. I mean, essentially, since 1977, Pakistan's electorate has always been divided between PPP supporters and TPPP. So that the NTPPP vote kind of gets divided, and the way it gets divided is what determines the outcome of the election. Do we have time for, yeah, we have time for a few more questions. Three more questions and I'm going to take them from all three young ladies here. One, two, and three. My name is Nochi Mahajan. I'm currently undergraduate student at the School of International Service. Uh, my question for you is, what is the future of Balochistan? Ah. Hmm. Pakistan has to really come to terms with understanding that Balochistan is Pakistan's Achilles heels right now. The Baluch are unhappy. And the Pashtun of Baluchistan also can't be very happy as a result. And the state of Pakistan should have learned its <coughs> lesson. You cannot make people feel they are part of the nation by force alone. So essentially what you have in Baluchistan is a very Hobbesian situation right now, war of all against all. 
the Taliban, Pashtun element is Taliban, the Hazaras are being targeted primarily because they are anti-Taliban uh, and it, that their Shia is just coincidental. And then of course there's the Baluch issue. It's all the more complicated by the potential for foreign intervention. I'm not saying because no evidence as well, but, but Pakistan's military believes that the Indians are playing a role. My argument would be, why would they succeed? Why would a Baluch take help from India or from the Afghans if he didn't really have a grievance? So remove the grievance so that he doesn't do that. And I think that that needs to be done. Unfortunately, Baluchistan doesn't have the electoral clout of, say, for example, Punjab, so nobody pays attention. It doesn't have the economic clout of Karachi that people pay attention. So Baluchistan ends up being a victim repeatedly. And it has been bombed since 1960, when first time Field Marshal Muhammad Ayub Khan sent troops in there. And we've had troops there unnecessarily. I feel tremendous sympathy and support for the people of Balochistan. But if we are to keep them within the Federation of Pakistan, we have to treat them with the dignity, respect, and accommodation that they deserve. Yes? Um, okay, this is kind of more of a domestic issue than Pakistan, but it, it does have to do with, with the relationship between Pakistan and the United States. But I'm curious what the government of Pakistan is doing to like, promote civil society and prevent this phenomenon we see in the Muslim world of terrorists um, preying on very young or children in, in, in their recruitment tactics because um, like these young boys have no they have no economic support and they have they have nowhere else to turn for certain things that they need in their lives. Like what the government of Pakistan is doing to mitigate that recruitment technique by extremist groups or whether or not they, they are ambivalent if they are not. Well, I think elements of the government are concerned, elements of the government aren't. Uh, Pakistan, as you know, I mean, being a federation, provincial governments behave differently. Uh, Punjab government has a very different view to it than the Sindh government. Lastly, it's an oversimplification to say that people are recruited because of poverty per se. I mean, of course, the poor are easier to recruit because they are kind of, you know, they have, the, if, if they had jobs, etc., etc. But, but, but most of the big jihadist extremists that have come out of Pakistan, none of them have come from poor families. I mean, this man called Umar Saeed Sheikh, who is in prison for being uh, the murderer of uh, Daniel Pearl, he went to London School of Economics. Uh, Hafiz Saeed is an engineer by profession. Uh, my greater worry is not about, I mean, poverty needs to be dealt with because it needs to be dealt with, but I don't want to conflate the two. The problem with extremism is that it's a pernicious ideology and that ideology needs to be, comp to, to be fought. So far, what the jihadis have managed to do and the extremists have managed to do is scare everybody. For example, anybody, well, why am I here? Why, why don't I go back? My problem is, you know, if somebody wants to send me to prison, I've been to prison before, I can be in prison again. That's not my fear. My fear is, what if somebody just blows me up like they did Salman Tarsi? Then I'm not able to do anything the day after. In a prison, I can sit and write books. <laughs> you know, it's not such a big deal. This is what they have done. They have scuttled the debate. And if you watch Pakistani media, the Pakistani media has created its own very narrow parameters of debate. It does not debate the very fundamentals of these guys. Uh, should this even be an issue? You know, um, um, the 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 the. Uh, uh, for example, very soon, you know, we, we we will have this guy called Amir Liaquat visiting the United States. I mean, I want to be able to protest against him. But why should he be allowed here? This is a man who on television said that God wants us to kill Ahmadis. You know. And nobody else, no other country allows that kind of stuff. This religious bigotry being transmitted as national ideology. And that's what needs to be fought. And very frankly, if you are Pakistani, here's my invitation to you. Stop worrying about the government. We, the ordinary Pakistanis, are the ones who will have to fight back on this and change this and say, who are you to define Islam in this narrow sense? Muhammad Ali Jinnah was not like this. He didn't have a... Uh, a one foot long beard and he certainly didn't wear shalwars above his ankles and he didn't go around sort of you know um, you can't 
hijack Pakistan and make it a Sunni Iran. We don't want it. And what, what is our vision for Pakistan? I often used to say, when I was ambassador, I used to have debates with, 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 with a lot of people in government, especially the generals, because they are the ones with whom I had the greatest differences of opinion. And I always used to say, what is your vision of Pakistan? What do you want Pakistan to be when it grows up? <laughs> do you want us to be a North Korea or a South Korea? Do you want us to be a Taiwan? Or do you want us to be an Iran? Let us have a vision for prosperity. I mean, I, I'm sure you were staggered by the figure I gave just now, that there are fewer Amer Pakistani students in American universities than there are Nepalese students. You, most people don't realize it, because you know, you're here, there must be 30, 40 of you, you guys hang out together, etc., etc. You have your dal and your chawal and your gap and your shak and you listen <laughs> to Rahat Fateh Ali Khan, and you don't realize the crisis of that country. And the crisis of that country is a crisis of ideas. What does Pakistan stand for? What does it mean to be a Pakistani? And what it means to be a Pakistani should be somebody who's from Pakistan, who stands for a modern, prosperous country that can play a role in a globalized environment in which Pakistani women should feel free to cover their heads, not cover their heads to feel free to wear a pair of jeans or wear a heavy duty commercial war. You should be judged not by what you wear, but what you do. And the economy should be booming like that of our neighboring country, India. And Shias and Sunnis and Ahmadis and Hindus and Christians of Pakistan should all be equal citizens. No judge should be saying, sitting in the High Court of Lahore as one judge did, saying, I don't want to pay any respect to this Hindu, even though the guy is a citizen. And people should not be killed just because they represent a different point of view than the mullahs who consider everything as blasphemy. <laughs> there's a fair, there's a couplet from, do you know Urdu? Um, okay, I'll translate well, it for you. Well. <laughs> yeah, there's a share of Fez Ahmad Fez, the famous Urdu poet, which says, Ke Unko Islam ke lut jane ka dar itna hai, kisi kafir ko musalma nahi hone dete. That they have created such a fear that Islam is constantly in danger, that on the basis of that fear, they do not allow a Muslim even to be a Muslim better than a non-Muslim. And this Islam in danger, Pakistan in danger, we are a nation based on fear. And that fear needs to end. India is going to walk in and take over, so we have nuclear weapons. We have now more nuclear weapons. And yet, we are, the fear never ends. Last question, young lady. Hi, uh, my name is Nahu, and I'm Pakistani. See, I knew you were a Pakistani. That's why I wanted to give you the last question. In fact, all, all my three choices for the last question were Pakistanis. I have, a, I have an instinct, instinctive understanding of my nation. Oh, I didn't notice that, by the way. I'm very passionate about Pakistani politics, so I promise that Mama would stay calm and not really, you know, ask any controversial questions. Oh no, you um, are more than welcome <laughs> to ask controversial questions. I'll ask one simple question. I've always wanted to ask a Pakistani politician. Um, you mentioned that most of the uh, aid from the United States goes to Pakistan. I wanted to know what happens with that aid. Uh, who is, who do we hold responsible for, like, utilizing that aid to make Pakistan a better place? Is it the president? Is it the parliament? Who it's very simple. You have to first understand what that aid goes for. The bulk of American assistance to Pakistan since 1948 has gone to the military. It has gone for Pakistan's so-called national security needs. The major economic assistance that the Americans have given has gone to projects such as Mangla and Tarbela Dam. That is the primary thing. And as a young Pakistani who probably reads or listens to Pakistan's media, etc., one of the things that Pakistan's military dictatorships have done is they have created a false issue in Pakistan, and that is the only problem in Pakistan is corruption. The fact of the matter is when, your, when, 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 the, when one third of your federal spending goes to the military, another third goes for uh, debt servicing, how much corruption can there be? So the, the corruption is actually a red herring. I'm not saying it's not there. It's a bad thing. It should end. But there is corruption everywhere and anywhere. You need to finish it off. And hopefully if you are in public service in Pakistan or here or wherever, you will be an honest person and will try not there not to be corruption. But 
The real problems of Pakistan are not because of corruption. They are because of wrong priorities. We spend more on bombs than we do on schools. That is the real problem. And that doesn't have to do it. And the politicians so far do not have the power or the authority to change that. Because you must remember again, for the greater part of Pakistan's history, the military has ruled <coughs> Pakistan. And the periods of civilian rule also have had very strong shades and shadows of the military. So once we can put them away, once somebody like me can stand in parliament and say, you know what, here is my resolution to cut military spending by 30%. And the first amount of military spending <coughs> I'm cutting is the, what, why, why is it that the car of a general, which by the way, when I was a young man, generals had small Toyotas. <laughs> now they have bulletproof Mercedes, 500 SELs. My point is, how does a general having a Mercedes 500 SEL improve Pakistan's defense capability? If it was a tank, <laughs> fine. But why is money, why is a golf course in Lahore cantonment run by the Pakistani army? Why is that? How is that adding to the defense capability of Pakistan? So cut that first. Let's get on with putting more money into Pakistan's insecurity now comes from low literacy, economic unproductivity. We are the lowest growing economy in South Asia. And in academic terms, falling behind. Those are the issues. Not, 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 and, and don't get into this bashing the politician culture that has been created by the military over the years. Thank you. Thank you.